Okay. What would yeah? What would be a good delivery date? I'm I'm indifferent towards what exactly. Would you like them to be due? Yeah, I think it's useful. I'd like to have them at least a day before class to give me some time to look over them and get sense for. Them. <clears throat> yeah, um, but we could have them do the Friday before. We could have them do Tuesday morning. Like what? If, what do people like in terms of deadline? Okay, since you brought it up, what would you what would you, what would your ideal deadline be? <laughs> Tuesday morning? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. We just, we just, yeah, I mean, it's so. Um, what what time on Monday night was it typically due? Midnight. Okay, then it doesn't. Ultimately, I'm not going to do anything between 10 p.m. Um, and when the kids go to school. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and um, on Tuesdays, so so yeah, uh, Monday at 10 p.m. is equivalent to me to Tuesday at 9:30. Um, so Tuesday, should we say Tuesday at 9:30, and that gives you gives you the night if you want. Okay. Uh, Bill, can you kill your uh, camera? Yes. And try um, clicking on Bitcoin for yeah. link and see if that comes through. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh, man. Oh, look at the look at the rainbow. Uh -oh. <laughs> yes. Um, so kill it in what way? Cover it with a piece of... No, stop broadcasting it. It's killing oh, my bandwidth. Ah, okay. Um, let me see. <laughs> Does anybody see a camera on here? Where would it be? Oh, just on... Oh, quick, okay. Okay. Can you still hear me, Bill? Or did you mute me? Something I did in the science museum once where you try to talk into this phone, it would just play your voice back at you and it renders you to mute. <laughs> okay. Bill, can you see now my intro slide? No, I can see a rainbow. Okay, give it a second. The lag is catching up. <laughs> Whoa, look at that. Do you see it? It's like being in Groundhog Day. <laughs> I think we'll be talking about distance collaboration later in this class, but th nevertheless, this is some a, a case study. Of it. I can't see your Skype anymore, but if you type into the YouTube chat room, I can see that. Okay, hola, gotcha. I can't see your Skype anymore, but if you type in the YouTube chat room, I can see that. Okay, um, so t Bill, if type into the chat and then I will see that. Otherwise, I'm kind of going blind here a little bit.
So give me a high sign on the YouTube chat when you want me to start. Just tell me to go or something. And I'm assuming you can see my face and the background slide. You should be able to turn off your Skype audio. I can see your message that says feedback is pretty bad. Okay, here we go. Let me uh, turn down my... All right. Well, absent any actual face, I'm not sure what's going on there. We'll just we'll just carry on smartly. Maybe it'll actually be a little easier without my face. Um, on to see whether or not I can actually um, communicate with you through that. It'll be a little bit of a delay. Um, as much as possible, I'd like those to, uh, this to be like a classroom, but it looks like increasingly that's going to be a little bit of a struggle. So give um, Bill a high sign if you want to ask a question over Skype, and I'll try and uh, to answer that. Um, uh, because of that, there's a little bit of a lag. Waiting, waiting. See that I'm muted. Testing, 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 testing. Testing, 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 testing. Okay, I'm going to carry on smartly. Um, it will we'll switch to Skype or good. Through this, audio is coming through laptop. We'll switch to Skype or Hangouts if necessary, but it looks like maybe it's working okay now. Okay, so let's walk through the um, contents of the course now. I was going to talk a little bit about introductions before I got going, but um, Bill had a little bit of an opportunity to do that. Basically, I'm here in Southern California. This is my family. That's my dog, hashtag Dodger. And uh, here in Southern California, the things that we've recently been going through is we just had this huge wildfire uh, that was the largest wildfire in California history. This is a view from our driveway going forward, and it was pretty devastating when we were there. The fire actually, although it was kind of much more devastating, we were able to see it coming. Shortly after that, we had some amazing mudslides. We didn't see that coming, and many people died as a result of that, which is tragic. But actually, we're all, it's all coming back now. It's uh, really beautiful in the uh, green grass that's uh, recovered. So professionally, as Bill mentioned, I got my background uh, education in computer science from Cornell. I got a master's of electrical engineering in, uh, from Cornell as well. I was a strike officer on board the USS Curtis Wilbur in Japan. And then I deployed to the Persian Gulf. I was also the ops officer on a second ship, the USS Simon Lake deployed again to the Persian Gulf in that uh, capacity. And then um, finally, I got a, uh, a PhD in computer science and engineering from uh, University of Washington in Seattle. 
where I graduated and then got a position with Bill at UCI. And at UCI, I was uh, a couple things, but for a while I directed the laboratory for ubiquitous computing and interaction. And then I um, did a bunch of startups while I was there. Uh, I'm very fond of logos. So the logos are Cube and Whisper and Swear and Weight Scout and Audia. None of them made any money. It's tragic, but um, don't stop. Don't stop trying. One in 10 startups um, actually succeed. So I need four more before I'm going to succeed. Uh, and then I moved to Westmont College, and uh, that's where I'm talking to you from now, down in the basement. Um, let's see. Uh, so my interest in Bitcoin is basically as a financial backstop. Uh, Bill and I have been doing a lot of research around this idea of collapse informatics, looking at the ways in which information technology can be used to build a more resilient future, given a lot of the challenges that we're facing, particularly with regards to climate change. but. Um, the knock-on effects from that as well. So Bitcoin for me is interesting because it provides resiliency in the uh, face of financial infrastructure failure. Uh, it also supports a basic social function, which is the exchanging of goods, and that happens regardless of what's going on with your civil environment, perhaps. Um, I'm also interested in creating a physical version of Bitcoin, which would be helpful in case you're ever in a situation where you don't have network temporarily. And although I'm not an inventor of Bitcoin, I have added features to it uh, so that it works differently, slightly differently, not dramatically differently, uh, to do what I'm kind of interested in it doing. So one of the ways that we were building our, um, our physical Bitcoin was to do 3D printing. And so we 3D printed a uh, Bitcoin uh, on Shapeways. We also tried some other techniques uh, to create those uh, physical Bitcoins. In, in addition to, to this, we also created uh, paper bills, which had RFIDs embedded in them. So that was sort of merging and um, blending the physical and the digital world, trying to support ways to do, continue to do economic exchange uh, with, like I said, with temporary network failures. All right, so let's walk through the technology of Bitcoin a little bit to get us started. Um, a lot of times what people ask is, what exactly is Bitcoin? And a common answer is that Bitcoin is a digital currency. Uh, it is that. Um, it is a way for people to buy, buy and sell things with their computers if they're so inclined. Uh, you can use it like money. It has some particular technological features, including the fact that it is decentralized. Um, it doesn't have a central authority that manages it. The transactions are anonymous, and I'll um, break that down a little bit in a second. It is a currency which is non-inflationary as well, and that's really radically different than the kinds of... Um, currencies that we currently are experiencing, that, that we have in um, most of the developed world now. Um, so these are particular technological properties of Bitcoin, and I would like to make a distinction in this regard because techn techn um, the technology of Bitcoin started up, uh, began in one way, and then over time, it started. people started thinking about Bitcoin as the uh, combination of two different kinds of technologies. So Bitcoin is, should have a distinction drawn in it in that it is both a way of um, providing, if you use a train metaphor, it is both the rails and the freight of that um, train car. And by that I mean that it is rails in that Bitcoin is a technology that enables the transfer of currency and it enables the transfer of digital rights. So that's one thing that it is. It is the rails that enables things to be moved around, but it is also the freight that gets moved around on those rails. So Bitcoin is the currency, but Bitcoin is also the pipes through which that currency flows. Or Bitcoin is both the, the pipes of the system, it is also the um, water that flows through the pipes. Bitcoin is the track, but it is also the currency that's being carried in the rail cars, if you will. These two ideas are blended. It, it creates some confusion when people talk about Bitcoin. And increasingly, people have been talking about the rails of Bitcoin as blockchain. And the freight of Bitcoin has been um, constrained to be talked about, particularly as just Bitcoin properly. Um, and of course, with both the rails and the freight working together, people can use the Bitcoin as currency. So one of the most important questions I think about Bitcoin itself that I think is interesting is whether or not it's actually money. And uh, that's a question that we can think about a little bit. 
So let's talk a little bit about the origins of Bitcoin or the uh, technology behind it. Um, Bitcoin is an algorithm. Uh, it was introduced in a white paper that was written about um, November 2008. Uh, the author of that paper was Satoshi Nakamoto, and that name is widely believed to be a pseudonym. Uh, the paper itself uh, was published, and then he eventually disappeared from the forums and the um, tech um, blogs and such that he was a part of. Uh, the paper, uh, this like the syntax of the paper, the spelling of the paper, the colloquialisms and mannerisms of the writing of the paper, suggests that he was one of who's a member of the Commonwealths of Nations author. So someone from one of the um, countries that has some connection to uh, the United Kingdom. So it could actually be from New Zealand, based on some of the ways that he spelled words and used phrases. Of course, there are other theories that it was um, basically a collective effort on the part of many people that were using a single name to describe themselves. But eventually he turned over the control of Bitcoin to a programmer named Gavin Anderson, who remained the lead technologist for several years, and that it has since turned over to someone else now. Um, the lead technologist being the person who is programming the reference um, version of the Bitcoin wallet. Um, the paper was this one. It's called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It's widely available online if you're interested in reading it. It's a technical paper. It focuses on the technology and the ideas behind Bitcoin. It is more or less what Bitcoin is today, although since this initial paper has come out, there have been modifications to the algorithm and the technology in order to support uh, changes in the way that people will use it, in order to support um, new features of it in order to support to some degree regulation of it as well. So now when people say Satoshi, they are referring to the smallest unit of Bitcoin that currently can be represented in the system. So it is a fractional um, component, a fractional piece of an overall Bitcoin. Uh, it's one, I think it's 100 million, so 0 0.000001. That's about uh, 1.3 New Zealand cents or 0.9 um, US cents. So that's a Satoshi. It's, it's like a, a neologism that's been used to describe the smallest, uh, it's kind of like a penny in Bitcoin, but it's the smallest unit that you can transfer uh, at all. Um, uh, smaller than that, you can't really go fractional right now. Additionally, so the name Satoshi is used for the Satoshi client, and the Satoshi client is the name of the software that runs the reference implementation of Bitcoin, or sort of the um, official uh, standard version of Bitcoin. Although there are several other, there are many, many clients that run their own version of Bitcoin that comply with the protocol of Bitcoin, but are not the technical reference um, version of, um, as we know it. Now the Satoshi client itself is very open, meaning that you can look at the code that is written to implement Bitcoin, you can download it, you can compile it yourself, uh, you can modify it. Uh, those are all open source, it's all open source. And that means that uh, Bitcoin achieves its security by design rather than by obfuscation, meaning that Bitcoin is not secure because you don't know how it works, it's secure because of the encryption and the passwords that are built into it. If you're interested in looking at the code, you can go to GitHub. GitHub is an online repository of software. And from there, you can download it. And actually, you can see all the changes that have been made along the lines. So right here is a screenshot of a client that I'm running on my computer. And uh, on my computer, I can, I can run that software. I can see all the people that have um, contributed to it and um, sort of look to see if there's any bugs or anything in it. When you take that software and you compile it, you end up with a client that looks like this. It's not particularly user friendly. And in this case, I've um, pixelated out some of the details of the transactions because I don't want people to de-anonymize me on the, um, on the network. Um, but basically, it's just a ledger. It's a ledger that shows uh, who you've sent Bitcoin to, from whom you've received Bitcoin. There's a little bit of an address book built into it so that you can um, remember uh, contacts that you send and receive Bitcoin with. Uh, and there's a little bit of overhead for um, maintaining connections to the net rest of the network so that you can see what the latest transactions are. All right, so this is where you get it, and this is where it came from. What does it actually mean to use Bitcoin? 
a lot of times people want to use the expression that I have Bitcoin, I have a certain amount of Bitcoin as if it resides on my computer. This client exists on my computer and this client is running on my computer. My Bitcoins don't technically reside on my computer. Bitcoins aren't like a file or something that you hold um, that you transfer around in that way. That wouldn't make a lot of sense because you could just copy that file and then you could move that file around and you could duplicate your Bitcoins over and over again. So Bitcoin doesn't quite work like that. You don't hold Bitcoin in, that, in the same way that you might hold dollars or cents. Instead, what you hold is you hold the rights to a certain amount of Bitcoin. And basically what this comes down to is holding a password. And so this password is something that you keep track of. And that password gives you the rights to move Bitcoin from one address, which you control through the password, to another address, which perhaps someone else controls through their password. And so by copying your password around, you're perhaps risking the security of your Bitcoin, but you're not actually duplicating your Bitcoin, you're just duplicating the files that control your password. So this, um, this password is a public private key pair. It's a cryptographic password, and it's not something that you actually uh, like type in, like this is my password, I'm gonna type it in to remember it. It's something that's generated by you by, um, by a computer, and you can see an example of it there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the Bitcoin address at the top is the one that you would use if you wanted someone to send you Bitcoin. You would give them the top number that starts with 16LHP. And that bottom uh, password that starts with 5K8Y is a private key. And that would be the key that would enable you to collect any of the Bitcoin that had been sent to the top address. So that enables, gives you the rights to move any Bitcoin that have been sent to the top address to a new address. So what does that look like? You have one address um, and you want to transfer it to another address and so you use the Bitcoin client in order to indicate where you want those Bitcoin to go. And you, you send an order basically to the Bitcoin network and the, that has to be signed with your password and when it gets released onto the Bitcoin network everyone works together to agree that your Bitcoin should be transferred. So that's uh, kind of how it works with rights. Who's actually keeping track of it? Um, the rights are being kept track of by everyone and no one. So the Bitcoin network is decentralized. There's no central point of authority in Bitcoin. You have many, many peers in a peer-to-peer -peer network that are all exchanging information simultaneously about who has rights to the Bitcoins. And the real innovation behind Bitcoin had to do with the way in which you could actually, how anyone could actually agree that Bitcoin belong to a certain key or a certain password when everyone is trying to resolve those ownership rights independently. When you start a Bitcoin client on your own machine, if you choose to do that, the first thing that happens is you're going to connect to an IRC channel, which is just like a computerized bulletin board, a computerized website, if you will. It's a little more primitive than that. And you're going to exchange, your, your client will exchange some configuration options with that channel and you'll be paired with usually about eight different clients, which will put you into a mesh of clients that are all communicating information about what's going on with the transactions together. And the first thing that your client will do is it will try and download the global ledger of all transactions. So if this was a physical manifestation of those transactions, it would be um, a big it would be a big book of transactions listing everyone who sent Bitcoin to every other person uh, along the way. And um, instead, when you download it digitally, it comes in the form of what we've now uh, begun to call the blockchain. Um, it, the blockchain is the global ledger of all transactions that have happened over all time in the Bitcoin network. So I guess that means that the Bitcoin blockchain is that ledger. When people talk about blockchains in other contexts, they're imagining a ledger that's keeping track of something else instead of Bitcoin. And so we get back to that idea of Bitcoin being both rails and freight. The blockchain that you download with Bitcoin is really part of the rails, and the freight is the information that's being written into the ledger at that time. So the blockchain itself has half of the information needed to confirm the rights of ownership in Bitcoin, and the other half is the private key, which you hold on your computer or in some other context. And when it comes time, 
uh, to transfer that, that, those Bitcoins, people who have the ledger can verify that your private key matches the public key that other people have uh, matched together and everyone can, can, can together confirm that all the um, transactions are valid. A at least that's, that's sort of the, um, you know, that's the, that's the basic understanding of what's happening. There are tons of variations that have been introduced to the system, but that's sort of like the way that Satoshi imagined it happening. All right, I'm gonna take a pause for a second and read the comments that have come in before I go to the next slide. So I see, um, hi, I'm interested, I have learned programming for iOS, but I am now a Ruby on Rails developer Maybe you can listen to Ruby Garage. That looks like something that's not related to our class. So I'm going to ignore that for now. Okay, so moving on, talking about the blockchain. What is the blockchain exactly? Well, the blockchain is a bundle of transactions that people have executed. So I said that overall the blockchain is this global ledger of all the transactions that have happened um, in the history of Bitcoin. But those transactions get grouped, and they get grouped together into a block. And so a block has you know, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 uh, transactions in it, typically. Um, in this diagram, it's shown as items. And those items are each a transaction. And they're being grouped together in that block. And periodically, a new block of transactions gets bundled together and gets put onto the blockchain. So that chaining word, that chaining technology that we're talking about, has to do with this hash code. And the hash code is a digital fingerprint, which takes both a fingerprint of the block of transactions, but also a fingerprint from the last hash code. And so over time, you can see that these hashes all get chained together, merging both the previous hash and the next block, so that at any moment in time, you can't go back, you can't change anything in this stream of blocks because that means that the, that the chain of hashes that have been created over time, the chain of fingerprints uh, would be broken as well. And so you would immediately recognize that someone had tampered with this blockchain. Um, if you look right now, you can look at the live transactions. This is, I downloaded this a few minutes ago. The average number of transactions per block is about 1,388. You can see it has varied over time. This is just, it looks like over um, the last year, what uh, the size of these blocks, um, this, the number of transactions has been per block. And the reason why it varies is for one, it varies depending on how many transactions people would like to make. It varies based on how, many, how much data is required to represent that transaction. And it also varies a little bit just based on the random process of putting together the blocks at one time. So um, it is in everyone's interest to put as many transactions into a block as possible because that makes transactions uh, happen uh, more quickly. Um, so just for reference, as of uh, May 1st, there were 520,781 blocks on the blockchain. And so that's how many blocks have been, uh, how many blocks of transactions have been wrapped up since Bitcoin started. Um, and uh, let's see, what else to say about that? Um, the, the, that entire blockchain as a result uh, takes up about 166 gigabytes. So if you actually were to start your client from scratch sometime you know, in the next 48 hours, 24, 48 hours, you would find that that initial initial initialization process of connecting to the Bitcoin network and downloading that global ledger so that you can participate would probably take several weeks just to download that initial file. And until you download all of that blockchain ledger, you can't, you can't actually send out new transactions from a local client. Um, and of course, you also have to have the disk space in order to um, have that on disk. As a result, there are many people that provide services so that you don't have to do this work yourself. So there are a lot of web-based services that will run a client for you, and you don't have to download the source code, and you don't have to download the blockchain either. And there, there are um, costs and benefits to that arrangement as well. So who's in charge of Bitcoin? No one. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't have a central authority and that has some downsides. For one, there's no recourse if something goes wrong. If for some reason your, um, your transaction, you make a mistake or you change your mind about sending um, money to someone, if that goes badly, well, that's too bad. You can't get your money back because there's just no way to claw back the funds because there's no central authority. 
And if you buy something with Bitcoin and you decide to change your mind, a, super, a very common practice in retail environments, even online, you know, returning something to Amazon or something like that, um, it's too bad. You cannot get your money back unless the party with which you undertook that exchange agrees to just send you the money back in a new transaction. And then that would also have to, um, you'd also have to coordinate getting the physical goods back if you exchange physical goods. So it's a very, it's like um, Bitcoin is uh, often introduced as a libertarian model and that there's no central authority and there's no one, in addition to there being no central authority, there's, all to, there's no central authority to regulate you, but there's also no central authority to protect you either. And so there are all kinds of ways in which we have come to expect certain protections in financial transactions that are not present in a generic uh, Bitcoin transaction. You know, you compare this, for example, to, um, you compare this to something, for example, like a credit card network, and a credit card network doesn't have, a credit card network does have a central authority. So if you pay someone with a credit card and they don't deliver, or you want to contest it, or they charge your credit card and you never received the goods, well, you can appeal to Visa or MasterCard or whomever your um, credit card company is, and you can get your money back through this central authority. They will retract the money. They will uh, eat the money um, as part of the cost of doing business or, or whatever, what have you. There's no, nothing like that in Bitcoin. Um, you can't get the money back. And so if you think about a metaphor for Bitcoin, when you send money via Bitcoin, it's a lot more like you're sending a box full of cash through the post. You're going to send it off, and as soon as you drop it into the mailbox, uh, that's it. You don't get to um, get it back unless you communicate with the recipient of the box of cash, and they agree to give it back to you. All right. Previously, I also mentioned that um, Bitcoin is anonymous, uh, but I should say that that anonymity is limited in the sense that, um, sorry, um, Bitcoin is anonymous, but um, the question is how can a system with complete anonymity, or sorry, complete transparency, be anonymous. It seems as if transparency and anonymity are at odds with each other. Well, not everything about Bitcoin is actually anonymous. It turns out that um, the fact that transaction, transactions are happening is completely transparent. So you can see every transaction on the blockchain. That bundle of transactions is visible. Everyone can see it. You can see the um, cryptographic address to which the Bitcoins have been sent. But what you, what's anonymous about that is you don't know um, who that cryptographic key is associated with. So if you imagine a cash transaction, in a cash transaction you might buy, buy something from someone with cash and you know exactly who you're doing business with, but there's no one that knows that the cash has traded hands. Bitcoin is kind of the opposite. Everyone knows that the currency has changed hands, but no one knows the parties that are involved. And so sometimes people talk about cash as being anonymous. It's anonymous, but it's anonymous in a different way. The central authority doesn't know who's involved in the transaction. Bitcoin is anonymous in that uh, the central authority doesn't know the parties involved in the, um, uh, let's see, you don't may not even know the parties involved in the transaction, even if you are participating in it. You could be sending money to someone whom you don't know, you just have their Bitcoin address. So there's a different kind of anonymity. So what's really anonymous is who controls the keys. Who has those passwords is what is anonymous about Bitcoin. However, anonymity is limited. Uh, social network analysis can break it. And by that, I mean if you pay attention to the connections between these addresses, who is sending money to whom, uh, and you build a um, structured network of those transactions, you can overlay that on other kinds of networks where the anonymity is not present. For example, if you can, you can match the shape of the Bitcoin network to a Facebook network and you can find that a lot of the same connections are present and through that you can de-anonymize or you can make um, educated guesses about who the different addresses are associated with. Of course, another way you can break that anon anonymity is just by telling people what your public address is. And so if you want to participate in an exchange, you often do have to tell someone what your um, address is. And at that moment, depending on how you do it, they're going to know that that address is associated with you. If you reuse your keys, it turns out that there's ways in which reusing your keys over and over again can um, increase the likelihood that your identity can be de-anonymized. And then, of course, and not interacting with someone in the real world can break it um, as well. You know, if, because the blockchain is completely transparent, you can look at it. 
Unfortunately, because it's 166 gigabytes large, it's difficult to look at it on your own computer. And so um, fortunately, there's several web services that are available that help you to explore it if you're interested in doing that. Uh, one of the um, most well-known is um, blockchain.info. And on this uh, page, you can see real-time statistics about the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, who's transacting money, how much, it, how much is it, um, kind of um, where is it going, how fast is it being transferred, all, all sorts of information about the currency exchanges because they're all visible. You can also see sort of the trail of money because if you link together the transactions, you can see how money flows through the system. So in this example, we can see that there's 1,386 1, Bitcoin starting at an origin point, which actually translates to an awful lot of money right now. And you can see that that Bitcoin is getting transferred to another account at the top there. And then that account is trans... Oh, let's see. Actually, I think it's moving right to left. Um, oh, no, no. That's right. Sorry. The left side is 1,386. And that's getting split into a payment of 1,370.85 and on and another transaction of 15.2012. So what's probably happening there is the person labeled origin is making a payment to this other person located in Canada, and that's revealed based on the IP address, of a certain amount, 1,370. Some kind of exchange took place between the person on the left and the um, person in the middle. And then the change that was left over from that um, exchange, which was a, appears to be 15.2012 Bitcoin, probably got sent back to the um, original person's wallet. And then you can follow how that money flows to the system because it continues down the line until up, up to the end you see that orange node and that orange node ends up receiving 1,365 Bitcoin and then there's some change from the, um, from the uh, transfer that um, went into it along the way. You can do more elaborate um, visualizations of this. So for example, I put together a visualization of about the first, uh, I think it's first 10,000 Bitcoin transactions on the blockchain. And so what this is, a, this is actually a, a still shot from an animation. It's available on YouTube. I'll give Bill the, um, uh, a PDF of the slide deck that I'm using today. And then the, um, the link to this video is embedded in the slide deck. But the way this is um, structured is that transactions between two parties are shown as a white arrow. And then the parties themselves are the purple dots. And the larger the purple dot is, the more money is flowing through it. And so you can see a lot of interesting things happening. On the bottom right, you can see a chain of transactions that were moving from one party to another and then ultimately to a central party. You can see these really large transactions in the middle. Uh, the one on kind of the middle right looks like it's probably some kind of a banking service. Maybe um, it might be something like Mt. Gox. Um, and then you can see a lot of individual parties in the Bitcoin ecosystem transferring money to one another. Um, so this was just one way to visualize it. Um, it's a little mesmerizing if you watch it animated. So um, in order to actually set up the transaction, though, it's probably the case that your anonymity has to be broken. And by that, I mean, let's say you're actually, let's say you're in a um, farmer's market, for example, and you're selling some sort of produce and someone else would like to buy the produce. And you set a price, you agree to a price, you negotiate it or whatever. And so you agree that you're going to transfer bitcoins to the merchants. And so the merchant, therefore, is going to give you the um, public address of her account. And as you buy the money, as you buy the produce, you'll send a certain amount of Bitcoin using the blockchain and probably a smartphone to her. And then she'll verify that it was received and then she'll give you the produce. But now in that moment, in that physical interaction, the identity, your both identities have been re revealed to each other. And so if you both were to go back onto the blockchain and look at the addresses that were associated with the two different um, endpoints of that transaction, you would now be able to associate well that, that that address is associated with the vegetable vendor and the vegetable vendor would be able to associate your address with you as well. Now if you two decide to keep that private, well it remains anonymous within the blockchain. But if either one of you decides to publish that somewhere online, well now a, a particular component of the anonymity of the, um, of the, you know, the Bitcoin ecosystem has been um, compromised. All right, so then I said that Bitcoin is non-inflationary. And what did I mean by that? Well, I meant that the amount of Bitcoin is capped. Um, there is a certain amount of Bitcoin that will all, only and always be available that's limited, and it's growing, but it's growing um, progressively slower and slower. Um, no one can create more. It's capped by algorithm. 
And so unlike, at least in the U.S., we've got the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve in the U.S. is responsible for increasing the money supply or decreasing the money supply in conjunction with monetary policy in an event to stimulate the economy or slow down the economy, whatever um, is currently you know, judged to be the best course of action by the political system. That's not possible in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is algorithmically capped. And so because of that, no new Bitcoin can be introduced, and so it's non-inflationary currency. In fact, it's a deflationary currency. And you can just recognize that because over time, people are going to lose some Bitcoins. They're going to lose them through losing their passwords. They're going to lose them through hard drive failure. They're going to lose them through perhaps death or um, you know, cognitive decline or something. And so over time, the value of any Bitcoin that you have is necessarily going to, well, the value of your Bitcoin will grow larger, assuming that the rest of the economy is behaving like uh, you know, any kind of sovereign economy. Um, so contrast that to dollars, which um, by uh, economic policy design, at least U.S. dollars, by economic policy design, dollars are designed to lose value over time as a way of, uh, uh, well, let's see, um, one of the ways in which it functions is to cause the U.S. debt to be, uh, to be less valuable, or to cost less to the U.S. government by inflating the money. So here's a graph of how it's um, scheduled to grow. Um, right now we're at 2018, and we've got about... Uh, 16 or 17 Bitcoin in circulation, and by 2033, built will be about capped out at the 21 million limit that we've got. Um, okay, so summary for the technological portion of Bitcoin um, is that Bitcoin has got some technological properties. There's no central point of failure for the exchange of Bitcoin because it is not centralized. It doesn't require a server or something in one central place to work. It does require the internet to work. So I guess the internet is a central point of failure. That has been shown to be pretty resilient. There's no central authority that's controlling the um, issuing of Bitcoin. Bitcoin transactions are anonymous and the amount of Bitcoin is capped. So I'd like to move on to talking about some of the social uh, arrangements around um, around uh, Bitcoin, but it's now 3.30. And so I just want to check in with Bill. Bill, should I continue talking? I'm happy to just continue the lecture set. Probably has about another 20 minutes. I'd also be happy to take questions, uh, whatever you think is appropriate, and I'm going to get a drink of water and see what your response is on the YouTube channel. Okay, so there's new Bitcoin that are still getting added. How do those new Bitcoin get added to the blockchain? All right, so if you, um, yeah, what's the technical process of mining? Okay, so what happens is those blocks that are each created and they get added to the blockchain, uh, they don't just get added to the blockchain uh, without some sort of verification. And what happens is at the end of each one of those blocks, there's a special sequence of bits and they are a sequence of bits that when connected with the rest of the bits that are present in that block of transactions cause the hash code itself to end in a certain number of zeros. So the process of trying to understand which bits you have to add to the transactions that are present in the block 
is what is called mining. And so mining means that you're randomly trying new bits over and over and over and over again, trying to find those bits that make the hash code have the right number of zeros at the end. And if you do find that random combination of bits, you are the one who successfully mined that block of transactions. And so built into the protocol is the understanding that the entity that found that collection of z uh, bits that made the hash code end in zero has won a prize. That prize is the reward for mining the block, for mining the block. That reward is then um, distributed to the person who, to the entity that, um, that found the numbers. And so when that entity is wrapping up the block, they include their address and then Bitcoin are created. Everyone agrees in the system that the person who created that gets a certain number of Bitcoin added to the address that they specified. So the process of actually closing that block entails adding the miner's address and adding those special bits. And when it gets put on the block, everyone can verify that, yep, they found those special bits. And so everyone agrees that they get the, a reward for mining the block. This is called a proof of work. It means that in order to win that prize, that reward for closing the block, you had to provide proof of work. And the proof of work are those bits that you calculated along the way. Now, the reason why Bitcoin is capped is because over time, the reward that you get for closing the block is decreasing. Uh, it started out in the early days, it was 50 uh, Bitcoin per block that was um, closed, for each um, block that was mined. Uh, it went down to 25, and I, I think it's down to 12.5 now. So periodically it halves. And so the idea is that over time, the reward for mining your block actually get the reward for mining blocks actually goes down over time and that's why the overall ecosystem um, is capped out at a certain amount of Bitcoin. Um, but as the reward goes down for mining the blocks a different kind of reward is increased and that is a transaction fee that each one of the people who would like to put money into a block can optionally add into the block. So this is a little bit of an economic, kind of economically brilliant, I think. A little bit of the details. Uh, so let me go into it for a second. When you propose a transaction from one key to another key, you also have the ability to specify a transaction fee. That transaction fee is a small amount of additional Bitcoin that you're sending to the miner, who in addition to getting the reward for closing the block, also gets any transaction fees that are present in the block that are closed. So over time, the reward for mining a block goes from just the reward that's associated with closing the block to being the reward that's associated with closing the block plus the transaction fees. And so there's this economic incentive that as Bitcoin becomes more popular, it becomes uh, increasingly incentivized to include a transaction fee on your transaction so that the miners will select your transaction to include in the block. The miners can put whichever transactions they want in the block, and they're likely to try and take as many transactions as they can that have a transaction fee, because if they are able to close that block, they get both the reward for mining the block as well as all the transaction fees. Those transaction fees aren't new, new currency, though. Those are coming from the person who is originating the um, transaction. Those are existing Bitcoin. The reward for closing the block is new Bitcoin entirely. Um, Bill. Uh, just to reduce the lag time, if other people have questions, feel free to just drop them into the chat and um, I'll, I'll periodically look and see, although that might be sort of hard to get people to ask them um, in the classroom environment. So I'm going to carry on. Uh, if you do have more questions, let me know. Uh, the social structure of Bitcoin is kind of important as well. And I'd just like to touch base about what anthropologists think about whether Bitcoin is money or not. Um, and really that depends on the people that are using it. So here is a um, humorous satire article from an American news site called The Onion. You're probably uh, familiar with it. And it just, they just put this article up that says, the US economy grinds to a halt as the nation realizes that money is just a symbolic, mutually shared illusion. So this is funny, but it's kind of true. Uh, there's nothing in the US currency that provides value to the currency, except for the fact that people believe it has value. Um, people believe that giving someone money has some sort of 
uh, effect on their future behavior. Over time, we've come to trust that that effect on their future behavior is sound, and we build up regulations and rules around it so that it increasingly is um, trusted and uh, valuable. But you can't turn in your dollar for anything that is uh, that it's based on. It's not backed by gold, for example. Um, it's it's just it's just this sort of illusion. And so in that way, Bitcoin is no less a legitimate currency than a dollar is, in as much as it's not backed by anything. But anthropologists would say it's not the fact that it's backed by something that makes it money. Money. What makes it money is the way in which it functions. And so typically, uh, there are ways in which money over the history of humanity has functioned, and it functions in particular ways. And the question is, does Bitcoin function that way? So for example, one of the ways in which money functions is that it functions as a store of value. And that means that if you have some sort of goods that you produce, you're a farmer, we always, the economic examples always go back to farming. But if you're a farmer and you produce a bunch of wheat and you would like to um, sell that wheat, but you don't want to trade it all right away because you would like to store that value over time, you need some uh, way of storing that value that's not going to be destroyed by corrosion or theft or loss or something like that. So money typically functions as a store of value. Whatever you're using as money can be stored so that you can accumulate wealth over time. So if that's gold, then great. You can put gold somewhere in a vault and you can store your value over time. But if that's US coins, that's fine as well. If it's some kind of a shell that your, your community uses as currency and people are gonna accept it, well then it's functioning as a store of value. Another way that it functions is probably the way you'd first imagine it. It functions as a medium of exchange. And by that, I mean that you use it um, in order to extend barter situations. So I might um, have wheat, you might have fish. If we both have the wheat and the um, fish together at the same time, we have a double coincidence of needs and we can exchange the wheat and the fish. But if my wheat and your fish aren't harvested at the same time, we might like to um, transmit, we might like to have a transaction that has this money concept in between so that either we can provide a, a temporal break between when that exchange happens, or we can resolve very complicated circuits of exchanges where wheat and fish and bricks and shoes and uh, housing can all be paid for. And you don't have to like, you don't have to find someone who wants fish in order to get a place to sleep for the night. You can exchange fish for money with the wheat guy, and then you can use that money to exchange for a place to sleep for the night. And so the medium of exchange enables you to get, our, get around this problem of bartering that requires you to specifically have something that someone else wants, it's sort of indirectly something that everyone wants along the way. Um, a third way in which it functions is it functions as a record of account. And by that I mean that um, a, a money is a way in which people keep track of debts to one another. Um, a ledger that I owe you some money, um, you will pay that back to me at some point in the future, and we're going to write that down and we're going to use money as the, um, if it is functioning as money, we will use units of that money in order to settle accounts. Uh, imagine a general store where you go in um, at the beginning of your growing season and you ask for, um, you know, um, some farming equipment and the store says, okay, I'll give you that farming equipment even though you don't have money right now and I will write down how much you owe me. That money is a record of account. If it's dollars, the dollars becomes the record of account so that later after you harvest and um, harvest your crop, you can pay back the general store for the farming equipment that, um, that you paid for. And so as a record of account, my, for, something to be, for something to function like money, it should also be used as a record of account, one of the ways in which money functions. A fourth way in which money functions is it functions as a method of payment, and this is differentiated from the other ones in that this is typically associated with taxes, meaning that the government will accept it as a way of resolving tax um, debts that you owe to a sovereign state. Um, and so, for example, in the US, you can only pay your taxes in dollars. Um, if you try and pay it in Bitcoin, you will get laughed out of the IRS office if you can find anyone to laugh at you. Um, but you could, of course, exchange your Bitcoins for dollars first in the same way that you could exchange your piano for dollars first, or you could exchange your Intel stock for dollars first, and then use those dollars to pay for your taxes. But in that case, what you've done is you've used the dollars as a medium of exchange, and then you've used it as a method of payment. Um, it's not that the piano itself 
or the um, Intel stock itself has been used as a method of payment. So the question then, is Bitcoin, a, is Bitcoin money? You can ask, well, is it functioning like money? Is it functioning as a store of value? Is it functioning as a medium of exchange? Is it functioning as a record of account? And is it functioning as a method of payment? Well, is it functioning as a store of value? Um, certainly not in the US. Uh, no one's using Bitcoin as a, as a um, store of value. Uh, I would say that in some places it is being used as a store of value. And this would be places where the national currency or the fiat currency does not have a lot of confidence. So places with hyperinflation, you think about Zimbabwe a few years ago, you think about maybe Cyprus, you think about uh, North Korea, maybe even China, places where people are very concerned about whether or not their national currency actually has any value, might choose instead to use Bitcoin as a store of value. That said, however, Bitcoin is extremely volatile uh, and as currencies go. And so what you might think of as a store of value doesn't function very well as a store of value if the value of the currency is going to drop drastically in six months or ten months or something. So really it's a relative question about, well, where are you going to hope to have your store of value? Is your national currency more stable? I'd say U.S. currency is definitely more stable than Bitcoin. Is the Zimbabwe currency from five years ago more stable? No. And so what people are willing to use as a store of value depends a lot on their context. Broadly speaking, I would say that people are not really using Bitcoin as a store of value. They're using it speculatively. Is it a medium of exchange? Now, to a limited degree, if you have Bitcoin and you would like to buy something, there are certain vendors that will, that will accept Bitcoin as the method of payment. Uh, there are some, particularly, uh, particularly in some technology companies that sell technology, routers, and computers uh, early on adopted Bitcoin as a method of, uh, as a medium of exchange by which you could buy their products. Um, over time, I've actually seen that starting to decrease. A few of the organizations that were willing to do that originally have stopped doing it because very few people were actually paying in Bitcoin. Uh, same thing with small vendors. You used to be able to pay with Bitcoin in a farmer's market when I was back at uh, UC Irvine at a swap meet. And... Um, at least they advertise that you could. I, I'm increasingly seeing less and less advertisement that you could pay with Bitcoin. The one time I actually did try and pay with Bitcoin at a farmer's market, the vendor actually couldn't get it to work. So it was more of a performative demonstration of technology uh, capacity than it was actually a functioning medium of exchange. Is it a record of account? Well, do people keep track of their debts in Bitcoin? Um, Generally speaking, I would say because it is so volatile, um, the answer is no. Although perhaps in some underground economies, Bitcoin is being used as a record of account. For example, in illegal drug trade, in illegal arms trade, maybe in illegal credential trade, it is being used as a record of account in different ways. And finally, is it being used as a method of payment? Pretty much no. I don't know of any um, national government that will accept Bitcoin as a way to pay taxes. So to that degree, um, is Bitcoin money? Um, it's functioning in some very, very small way as money. Uh, I would say it's functioning much more right now as a speculative investment. It looks a lot more like a penny stock to me than it does like money, but it certainly has the features that would give it the ability to be currency in the future. All right, I check for questions. Uh, I don't see anything there. So let's uh, touch base just what would it look like to participate in Bitcoin. Uh, participating in Bitcoin means that you have to get an account with some kind of Bitcoin exchange. So Coinbase is one that's pretty well regarded. Uh, you would establish an account with Coinbase and then you would get some kind of a um, dashboard that looks like this that shows you uh, the current price of Bitcoin and you know different statistics about it, much like the blockchain website. You can see that in addition to Bitcoin, there are other kinds of digital currencies that are available for purchase. And then what you have to do is, in the U.S. anyway, I'm not sure how it works in New Zealand, but in the U.S. you have to connect your, your Coinbase account to your bank account, and then you would transfer money from your bank account to Coinbase. And then Coinbase would function a bit like a stock exchange. So you would get an account on Coinbase, you would connect your bank account to it that way, get the money into your Coinbase wallet, and then you purchase Bitcoin in the same way that you purchase stock. Uh, you either buy it on the open market or you set a price at which you would like to buy it. You specify how much you want to buy. And then Coinbase executes that transaction as uh, like a stock exchange. Um, and then once you've made that transaction, now Coinbase is acting as your client software. 
and Coinbase maintains your um, keys for you. Your cryptographic keys are maintained in Coinbase, and the user interface looks, um, it, you know, abstracts away the idea that you actually have passwords. It just um, they, they make it much simpler. But if you would like Coinbase to transfer your bitcoins to uh, your personal client, say for example you're running the Satoshi reference client, you can totally do that. You can they, you can leave the bit the Coinbase ecosystem and send it to your laptop, and then your laptop will indicate that you have Bitcoin available to you and that you could then transfer it um, that way. So what's the time look like? Well, in the US, transferring via an ACH transaction to Coinbase takes about one week, and there are various kinds of limits on that transaction that are associated with regulations that are primarily um, to limit uh, terrorism. Uh, this isn't just limited to Bitcoin, but um, large dollar transactions are uh, are, are scrutinized in the U.S. to um, prevent money laundering and, and, and terror, funding of terrorism. Um, something, something on the order of $5,000 a week is the limit. Um, and over that, it's not that you can't transfer the money, but it gets reported to um, um, U.S. government authorities. I'm not sure which agency would get it. That transfer takes about one week. Uh, once your money is on Coinbase, you can execute a trade. The trade itself can be instantaneous as long as you don't care about the price, I meaning as long as you're making a market priced trade. Um, the confirmation that you now have Bitcoin will take between one and two hours as the blockchain uh, gets updated with that transaction. And then if you want to transfer your Bitcoin to your, your own or someone else's client, uh, you can get evidence of your intention in about one minute. That means that your transaction is out in the peer-to-peer -peer network and everyone sees that you're trying to transfer Bitcoin. Um, depending on whether or not you put a fee on that transaction, uh, that will get incorporated into a block in as fast as like six minutes, but it could take as many as 24 hours or 48 hours if you don't put a high transaction fee on it because you don't particularly care about the speed of the transaction. Uh, so finally, the last thing that I want to um, just mention is that there are significant risks in participating in the Bitcoin economy. Um, and they can be mitigated in different ways, but it's hard to mitigate them entirely. So one of the ways in which you can have uh, risks is by hackers. Because basically, computer hackers are very interested in getting access to your Bitcoins at every step in the, in every step in the process. So they would love to be able to steal your Coinbase login credentials. They would love to be able to break into your computer and um, put a key logger on your computer and watch you type in the password to your, coin, to your local client. Um, they would love to hijack the things that you're typing into your various uh, transaction um, software so that rather than sending the Bitcoin to the person that you intended the Bitcoin to go to, you would send it to their criminal um, address instead. Um, you know, because just like there's no recourse for getting those Bitcoins back, there's also no grace in the system for typos. So if you type in the wrong address and it checks out as a valid address, you cannot get that Bitcoin back. So you know, if, if a bad guy is able to get their address into that transaction really quickly before you're able to complete the transaction, the Bitcoins are gone and there's nothing you can do about it. So security is a really um, serious concern in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Working with an organization like Coinbase helps to mitigate a lot of that um, concern as well. But as a result, Coinbase becomes a single point of failure and tons and tons of um, people are trying to hack into uh, Coinbase in order to steal the money that Coinbase has accumulated. There's a very famous example of Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox was one of the very first um, Bitcoin exchanges um, and they were, they were um, run by people who were not particularly technologically security savvy, computer security savvy, and hackers or an inside job or something um, took the entire collection of everyone's Bitcoins that were stored at Mt. Gox and um, took off with them. If your hard drive crashes, you're going to lose all your money as well. So you better have some good backups. You probably want off-site backups as well. So that, that's the um, summary of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, again, I'm happy to take any questions, but I'll tell you what, at this point, maybe it would make sense to switch back to Skype just so that we can avoid the um, laggy behavior. And although it might mess up some of our, um, it might mess up some of our um, interactions, uh, we won't have the lag and we can have a little bit more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So thank you for your, atten for, for your attention. Sorry for the original technological glitches. Uh, I'm going to shut down the stream now and switch over to um, Skype.